In this section, we're going to go over 20 multiple choice questions from the June 2023 Regents exam. This is part B-1 with question 31, which Lewis electron dot diagram represents an atom of nitrogen in the ground state. A Lewis dot diagram for an individual element means you put the element symbol and the valence, which is your outermost electrons, on the outside of the symbol. Let's go to the reference tables and find nitrogen element 7 right here. For the dots, it's the valence or the outermost electrons. You can do that one of two ways. The 2-5, the 5 tells me there are five outermost electrons, or when you're dealing with groups 1, 2, and then 13 through 18, you can drop the 1 for the 13 through 18, and it's in group 15, which is all five valence electrons. Choice with the five dots is choice two. For 32, we're dealing with atomic mass and natural abundance. For silver, there's always going to be an atomic mass determination type question on the Regents exam. It shows up every time, and this is no exception, right? We have the mass, we have the percent abundance, and we have to take these out of percent. We can multiply the mass times the natural abundance. For each of these, add them up and divide by 100. And a lot of times here, you're either going to see the percent symbol or they've already been taken out of percent. In this case, for the four choices, it's going to be the 106.905 times the 51.8. And that makes choices three and four incorrect because they went ahead and switched these. And of the two, the best choice is going to be number two because since they didn't slide the decimal over and divide by 100, we still need the units as percent. Question 33, potassium atom has a mass number of 37. Now, hopefully you remember what the mass number is. The mass number is your protons plus your neutrons. You're asked, what is the number of neutrons in this atom? We need to take the 37 and subtract the atomic number for potassium. Now, don't guess. Go to the periodic table and get the atomic number. We're looking for potassium. Potassium's symbol is K. If you don't remember that it is K, real simple, go to reference table S. That will give you the names of the elements and the symbols. Here, we need the 19. We're going to go back, subtract that from the mass number to get the number of neutrons. Now, we're going to take the 37. We're going to subtract 19, and the answer is 18. 34 at room temperature student determines the density of a sample of a nickel to be we're given the density here of 9.79 based on table s what is the percent error for the density of nickel we're going to table s we're going to get the density then we need the percent error formula which is on reference table t we're looking for the density for nickel the density is here in this column and we're going to scroll down 8.90 is the true value. Now, if we go to reference table T, we also need the percent error calculation, which is here. Here is the equation. The measured value, that's the same as the student value. That's your 9.79. And then 8.90 was the accepted value. So we're going to subtract the two numbers and then divide by 8.9 again and then times by 100. When you do all that, you're going to get an answer of 10%. Now, right now we can't see the answers, so let me erase this. And now you can see for 34, it's choice 4. Question 35, we're looking at metals in period 2. That's row 2 of the periodic table, and we're comparing them to the non-metals. So compared to the metals in period 2, the non-metals have and we're going to look at first ionization energies and electronegativity values. What I would suggest is that we pick out a metal and a nonmetal on the periodic table for period two, then go to reference table S and compare numbers. Checking out period two, let's pick lithium as our metal here. Your metals, of course, are on the left-hand side, and your nonmetals are on the right-hand side. We're going to compare lithium, let's say, to fluorine. We're going to go to reference table S now. At reference table S, I went ahead and circled the first ionization energies and the electronegativities for these two elements. And it's fairly obvious once you circle them that fluorine is higher in ionization energy and electronegativity. 
and please when you're practicing mark up your reference table you can always get a new one print it out get it from school but it's worthwhile marking it up so you actually you see the answer we're looking for the answer that has higher first ionization energy and higher electronegativity for the non-metal compared to the metal which is choice four for 36 we're looking for the formula that represents calcium hydride now you can tell from the four choices ca is calcium if you didn't know the symbol for calcium you could go to reference table s and then it's just the question of am i dealing with h's oh's and then how many you have a binary compound when you have calcium and hydrogen and you have what's known as a ternary compound in other words a polyatomic ion when you have more than two elements easiest thing to do is to go to the reference tables and find the polyatomic ion name for your oh and let's do that here it is oh minus is hydroxide we're looking for calcium hydride and that means it's just calcium bonding with hydrogen remember when you have a binary compound the non-metal gets the IDE ending. Let's go back and finish this out. Actually, I want to show you right here. Calcium hydride, you got to remember this is a, an ionic compound. The metal or the electron giver is written first and then the electron receiver is written second. Now hydrogen typically gives its valence electron, but your group one and your group two metals are so reactive compared to hydrogen that they're going to force hydrogen to take it. Since calcium is a plus two and hydrogen in this case is a minus one, your formula is not going to be CaH. It's actually going to be CaH2 because you need two hydrogens, each taking one of the two valence electrons from calcium. That makes the answer for question 36, choice two. For 37, what is the number of moles in 78.8 gram sample for MgCO3 and they give you the gram formula mass. If you don't know the mole formula, you go to reference table T and we're given the gram formula mass and the mass. Let's go there. I want to show you something. The number of moles shows up a few times. Under mole calculations, the word moles. Under molarity of concentration, we have moles and that's it so those two places are where we see moles there's also two places where we see molarity but right now we're talking moles which equation you use depends on what numbers you're given in the formula be careful with that now in the question we're dealing with we're given a mass and we're given a gram formula mass and so we're following this top equation 37 then we're taking our 78.8 we're dividing by 84.3 70.8 is the mass and 84.3 is the gram formula mass and we end up with an answer of choice 2 of 0.935. Question 38, we see we have an equation here and it's asking which type of chemical reaction is represented by the equation. Look at what you're starting with and what you're ending with. You have an element and a compound and then a compound and an element. Of the four choices, what we're talking about here in 38, single replacement. For 39, it says based on reference table H, which compound has the strongest intermolecular forces at 60 kPa of pressure? Let's go to table H and get the answer. What I did is I put a line across the 60 kPa mark, and this is what I call a high-low question. Okay, propanone is going to have the highest vapor pressure or actually take the the least amount of temperature i guess i should say they're all at the same vapor pressure to get to the 60 kpa ethanoic acid you're going to have to put in a lot more energy to get to 60 kpa why because ethanoic acid has stronger intermolecular forces than these other three substances on reference table h and that would go no matter what the temperature is when we're comparing or the, the vapor pressures. Propanone is your weakest intermolecular forces. Ethanoic acid is your strongest. And then ethanol and water are in between. That makes the answer for question 39, choice one. We are at the halfway mark 
for this part of the exam. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. Hit that notifications button. I'll be going over the other sections as well and any Regents exams in the future, along with college level stuff, interesting chemistry stuff. I'm glad you're here and working hard. Let's keep going. For question 40, we're looking at a particle diagram that's representing xenon at STP. Xenon, if you don't know the symbol, XE, look it up on reference table S, and you're going to see that xenon is part of the noble gases, which is column 18. We want to show it as a gas, of course, at STP, which means we're talking choice one. Question 41, we're looking at which compound is less soluble in water as the temperature goes from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. Well, just looking at the choices, choice 1, 3, and 4, you're dealing with ionic compounds or your salts. Those are solids at room temperature. Ammonia is a gas, and gases decrease in solubility as you increase temperature. Choice 2 is going to be your answer. But also, let's take a look at table G. I drew arrows for the four different choices, and you can clearly see that ammonia is decreasing as the temperature is increasing. Question 42. This is exactly what I was just talking about. We're calculating moles again, but this time we're going to use the second of the two equations on reference table T. Molarity, which is concentration, is equal to moles over liters. This is for solution concentration. I have a molarity of 0.2 molar. I'm looking for the number of moles and my volume is 0.5 liters. Now be careful. In order to solve for moles, I'm going to multiply 0.2 by 0.5. I'm not dividing. I'm multiplying to get moles alone. 0.2 times 0.5, that's 0.1, and the answer then is choice 1. Always put the numbers in your calculator. You don't want to make a silly mistake. Question 43. I guarantee you a lot of students ended up getting this wrong. Not that it's difficult, but we're dealing with parts per million, and we're dealing here with choices in scientific notation. If you don't know scientific notation so well, it's easy to make the mistake. Now, parts per million is also the second of the two concentration calculations or parts per million. Let's go take a look because we didn't look before. Here it is on the concentration. We see the parts per million calculation and then the molarity equation we just worked with. Now I do want to point out to you, remember solutions have two parts, the solute and the solvent. When it comes to these questions, we just want to make sure that we have, in the case of parts per million, the mass of the solution. That's the solute plus the solvent. Sometimes they'll try to trick you. Let's go back and take a look. Here we have the grams of the solute, the 9.8, and it's in enough water to make 1,500 grams of total solution. So that's good. That's going to go in the denominator. So we're talking about 9.8 divided by 1,500 times 1 million. Now, you put it in the calculator, and you get an answer of 6,533. Well, Hopefully you notice right away, you can cross out one and three, they don't match. And from here, hopefully if you remember that a negative exponent means the number in front is actually less than one, that it's gotta be choice four, because 10 to the three means you would be multiplying 6.53 times 1,000, and that's what makes four the answer. We're up to question 44, we're looking at a PE diagram. Each interval on the potential energy diagram represents a hundred kilojoules of potential energy. And it is asking what can be concluded from the diagram. The first thing that they're asking about is, is it endo or exothermic? In order to determine that, right, that's our delta H, just look at where we're starting and where we're ending. We started low and we ended up high. The reaction is endothermic. So cross out three and four and then what are we talking about as far as the energy? Is it a plus 200 or a minus 200? Well, remember, we're going in intervals of 100. We started at 100 and we ended up at 300. And anytime we figure out the heat of reaction, it's the products minus 
the react. In other words, 300 minus 100, which is a plus 200 or choice two. For question 45, we're looking at an organic compound. How do I know that? Because there's carbon in the compound. We're asked about the chemical name. This isn't just the straight hydrocarbon or alkane because there are two bromine atoms represented on this compound structure. Well, how do we name it? What you want to do is you want to count the longest carbon chain. That's going to be the end of the name. I'm just going to go ahead and circle it and literally count how many carbons we have, and we have five. Now, if you don't remember the prefix of pent, you're going to go to the reference table. The only other thing we have to do, based on the choices then, we know they're dibromo, meaning two bromines, would be the numbers. Number of the carbon chain, one through five, or backwards would be one through five. And whatever numbers are your lowest, that's the numbers that are used in the name. So we have a bromine on the first carbon and a bromine on the second carbon, which makes the answer choice three. We're up to question 46. We're looking at an electrochemical cell and we're asked which process is represented by this diagram. It is definitely not chromatography. That's a separation of a mixture. It's not distillation, which again is separation of a mixture, in that case a solution. It is definitely electrolysis. We're using electrical energy to force a redox reaction to happen, and polymerization is an organic reaction. For 47, we're looking for a solution that has the greatest ability to conduct an electric current. That means we're looking for an electrolytic solution or an electrolyte. Two things, how many pieces it breaks up into and concentration. Sodium chloride or NaCl is going to beat out glucose because while glucose is soluble in water, it does not break apart into ions. Sodium chloride breaks up into the sodium ion and the chloride ion. And then of the two choices, 0.1 is a greater concentration. Your answer then is choice one. Question 48, we're looking for what fraction of the original sample of iodine-131 remains unchanged after 24.063 days. That means we're going to start with one, and then we're going to have it each time we hit a half-life. Now, we're not given the half-life for iodine. That means we need to go to the reference tables. I already circled it. It's 8.021 days. We're going to take that back to the question. What I usually tell my students to do to draw a chart similar to what you see here. T for time, M for mass. At time zero, we have the whole thing. We're dealing with fractions here. We're going to hit the first half-life, and we're going to have half of the original sample, and the other half is going to have been decayed into something else, and that eight point and change days would have went ahead and passed. Another half-life goes by, and we have eight plus eight, or around 16 days. That's a little over 16, and I have half of a half, which is a quarter, and then finally I'm going to add another eight for a total of 24 days just over 24 days, which matches the time on our question. And we're going to have half of a quarter, which is an eighth. That makes the answer for 48 choice one. For 49, we're taking a look at another equation now and what type of reaction we have. You can spot a nuclear equation fairly easily because you're given the mass numbers and atomic numbers. There is no way then this is a combustion or a substitution reaction. Those are just regular chemical reactions. This is a nuclear reaction. Then the question is, are we talking fission or fusion? For fission, you're taking a heavy nuclei, uranium-236, and it's splitting. Or fusion, you're taking light nuclei and making something heavier. Don't let the neutron here throw you off. The answer is nuclear fusion. Finally, for question 50, we have a nuclear equation again. Again, we're given masses this time, and it says, what is the amount of mass converted to energy as a result of this reaction? Well, with nuclear equations, you get a lot of energy coming out compared to a chemical reaction. And the reason being is Einstein's equation, E is equal to mc squared. A little bit of mass is converted into a lot of energy. All you're going to do here is you're going to add up the two masses on the left side, multiply the mass here on the right side by two, and take the difference of the two, and that will give you the mass that was converted into the energy. On the left, you get 8.0291, and on the right, you get 8.0052. Take the difference, and here's my answer in choice one. That's the mass that's converted into energy, and that ends section B-2 of the June 2023 Chemistry Regents exam. Keep practicing questions, go over your notes, make sure you have your calculator when you do your calculations, keep working hard, and good luck.